Just how much American soil does China control? And are the plots of land too close to U.S. military bases for comfort? The answer is we don't know. With our most recent data based on a two-year lag, how serious is this loophole to America's homeland security? And how do you think it will play out? We break down the key points in today's episode. Share your thoughts below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. About twice the size of New York City, that's how much land Chinese companies or investors own in the United States. The exact number, over 380,000 acres. It's a relatively small figure, but the key isn't how much land is owned, but where it's owned. And that's causing concerns. Are any of these plots of land close to U.S. military bases? Could Chinese telecommunications equipments be set up to tap our military communications? The thing is, we don't know. The most recent data, 380,000 acres, is from two years ago. Alarm bells over Chinese land ownership have been ringing for a while, ever since the news broke that Chinese buyers have been scooping up land near U.S. military bases. A Chinese coin milling company bought land 20 minutes away from the Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. A former Chinese general also bought land near the largest plot training base run by the U.S. Air Force. That's in Texas. What's more, Washington doesn't even have the most up-to-date information on how much land Chinese investors control on American soil. The USDA relies on foreign buyers to report land deals on their own by filling out a form. Lawmakers are pushing for the agency to shift to an electronic filing system, but Congress hasn't approved funding for the transition, so it may take a while. Here's what we do know. According to a report from NPR, a Chinese billionaire named Sun Guangxing controls over 40 percent of all Chinese-owned U.S. land. He's also a former Chinese military general. Sun was the investor that bought land near the Air Force Base in Texas. Smithfield Foods, America's largest pork producer, owns about another third. That's mainly in North Carolina. But Smithfield lost its American identity long ago. A Chinese pork company bought it up in 2013. The bulk of the rest is owned by Walton International Group in Arizona. Walton is a real estate management firm based in the state. Lawmakers are currently pushing for several bills that would restrict Chinese ownership of U.S. land. As U.S.-China tensions continue to mount, how can U.S. President Joe Biden work toward a thaw in the relationship? Or maybe the bigger question is, would Americans even allow it? A New York Times article highlights a growing concern. Citing polls, it says Americans' attitudes toward modern-day China are starting to resemble the sentiment toward the biggest U.S. adversary from decades ago, the Soviet Union. Years ago, it was Ronald Reagan who dubbed the Soviet Communist Party as the evil empire. Well, there's a new evil empire in the 21st century, and that's communist China. And we will deal with them. Here's a comparison based on surveys archived at the Roper Center. Note the similarities between Americans' unfavorable views of the Soviet Union before the Cold War and how they view today's China. But what started this trend? Similar to how the American perception of the Soviet Union deteriorated when it gobbled up parts of Eastern Europe, views on China collapsed in 2018 as a result of the trade war. The COVID-19 pandemic and questions about its origin worsened the situation two years later. Plus, recent news of China's mass detention of Uyghur Muslim minority, Beijing's partnership with Russia, competition with the U.S., and the Chinese spy balloon incident. Combined, those issues have driven the U.S. perceptions of China to record lows, with experts describing the trend as a feature of a Cold War. This Cold War mentality is also appearing in other areas. Right now, polls show more than half of Americans favor defending Taiwan if China invades. Two-thirds see the Chinese military as a critical threat to the U.S. over the next decade. And most Americans favor reducing trade ties with China. And it goes both ways. China's public opinion has become similarly negative toward the U.S. As for what that means for policymakers, research shows public opinion can drive the government's decision making, even in non-democratic countries. And such decisions can both shape and be shaped by public opinion.
Experts say a souring public opinion in both China and the U.S. may further worsen relations between them. As Beijing voices support for Russia following the Wagner uprising, what should the rest of the world expect? And how should the U.S. respond? We spoke to Bradley Thayer, founding member of the Committee on the Present Danger China, for insight. Joining us now for some discussion is Bradley Thayer, director of China policy at the Center for Security Policy and co-author of Understanding the China Threat. Bradley, it's so great to have you with us today. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to join you. Would you consider the uprising a vulnerability for President Putin? And what does this mean for the Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping and what some are calling the global axis of authoritarianism? So even though it was aborted, uh, Putin is greatly weakened by that event. And from China's perspective, Xi Jinping must be wondering if it's time for regime change uh, in Moscow. Uh, maybe it's time to swap horses. And the critical question there is, is there somebody that they have lined up to whom they could turn uh, more effectively? Bradley, an analyst say China Xi has a great deal to lose if Russia is humiliated in Ukraine as Beijing pushes its influence in Asia and as their own rest in Russia is said to create a risk of conflict among these former Soviet states in China's backyard. How will China's support for Russia following the insurrection of the Wagner Group against Moscow affect the world? If China did not support Putin, uh, the likelihood that uh, that war would brought, be brought to a peaceful conclusion is much higher. But far more worryingly, from the standpoint, if you will, of global stability, is that while the West's attention is focused on uh, Ukraine and the humanitarian disaster which is occurring there, uh, the, Taiwan remains tremendously vulnerable to invasion, to attack uh, by, um, uh, by China. Bradley, I want to ask, what should the U.S. do in response to the mutiny and China's reaction to it? Well, what the U.S. should do, of course, is uh, take measures not just to condemn it, which they certainly should do, uh, but to take military measures to ensure that uh, we're able to uh, ensure that we have the right military capability in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, to deter uh, China's aggression against Taiwan or against other states, uh, allies or, or partners uh, in that uh, region. And we need to labor uh, far more actively than the Biden administration has done uh, to place it there so that there is an, an, an uh, ability uh, to deter China's aggression against Taiwan. Bradley Thayer, Director of China Policy at the Center for Security Policy. It is great hearing your analysis. Thank you. It was my pleasure to join you. Russia's one-day coup has sent shockwaves through its strategic partner, China. While officials try to downplay the incident, Chinese social media is revealing a different story. Let's take a look. Over the weekend, a flurry of social media posts filled Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter. The hashtag Putin accuses Wagner head of treason attracted over 2 billion views in just 24 hours, with many discussing how Russia's hypothetical civil war would affect China. Wagner's uprising shattered the image of a strong, stable Russia often touted by Chinese officials. That sparked fears that infighting could weaken Beijing's key ally against the West. One user wrote, when Russia collapses, the wolves headed by the U.S. will have greater energy to target us. Some voiced fear that the instability would spill over into China. Another user described it with a metaphor. When the lips are gone, the teeth will feel the cold. The expression hints at a common fate between Moscow and Beijing. Wagner's advance in Russia also raised another question. Will a similar coup happen to its communist neighbor if Xi Jinping remains bent on achieving his military goals in Taiwan? Former New York Times correspondent Edward Wong wrote on Twitter, that if there's any single event during the Ukraine war so far that would make Xi rethink invading Taiwan, this is it. Though others argued that Putin's woes won't play out the same way with Xi, given Beijing's tighter grip on the military, plus its intense nationalist influence campaigns for soldiers. Is China a democracy? The answer is no by most international standards. But Beijing is still busy trying to convince the world that it's also a democracy and one that's better than the U.S. Over the weekend, China's new ambassador to the U.S., Xie Feng, tried to convince an American audience of just that. Speaking at a conference in Washington, he painted a vivid picture of China's modernization and its so-called advancements in human rights and democracy. 
China has been constantly developing whole process people's democracy. It is people's democracy in nature and also represents the will of the state. It is therefore extensive, genuine damn democracy that truly works. Xie went on to quote a poll on public satisfaction with the communist regime. According to a decade-long Harvard poll and surveys by Edelman, the Chinese people's satisfaction with its government has stayed above 90 percent for years in a row. Xie even touched on China's human rights record. China is committed to a human rights development path that meets the trend of the times and suits our national conditions. But countless reports from human rights groups form a stark contrast to that message. Global concerns have also been raised over China's restrictions on freedom of speech, assembly and association, plus internet censorship and the persecution of ethnic and religious groups. Aside from the speech, an earlier controversy has also followed China's new envoy to the U.S. Earlier last month, Xie Feng kicked off his first day in office with a bang, highlighted by a pair of eyebrow-raising letters, calling on his fellow Chinese compatriots and students in the U.S. to serve the motherland. Much of the West has raised concerns about Chinese Communist Party's infiltration both into American society and beyond. A recent report is shedding new light on the state of civil rights in China. A New Zealand-based project called the Human Rights Measurement Initiative published the study, which lists China as the most dangerous state when it comes to safeguarding its citizens' civil rights. The Chinese regime keeps a strict grip on civil and political rights, making data extremely difficult to collect through surveys. To combat that, the report looked at economic indicators using publicly available statistics instead of surveying citizens. Interestingly enough, China scored near the top of more than 100 countries when comparing the data from Beijing's official statistics. But anonymous online surveys paint a different picture. Critics of the Chinese regime say ethnic minorities often miss out on essential economic rights, and not only in mainland China. Since the city's pro-democracy crackdown in 2019, Hong Kong's score on freedom of assembly has dropped. A spokesperson from the New Zealand Project notes that in a repressive environment, seeing scores rise is contrary to human rights improvement. Instead, it means authorities have implemented more repressive measures and effectively suppressed dissent. Forced to relocate and cut off from water and power, a disbarred Chinese human rights lawyer has been forced to move 13 times in two months. It's part of a broader campaign, seemingly to harass prominent rights advocates in Beijing. Now a victim is speaking out. In the past two months, we have been forced to move a total of 13 times. This is the newest house we have stayed in. In a borough apartment on the outskirts of Beijing, human rights lawyer Wang Chuangzang explained the situation he's in. On the second night, right after we moved in, the police came to our door and said that we had trespassed in the house illegally and then asked us to handle the situation. Then they started taking a series of measures to harass us. Unidentified men guarded the Wang's family door, barring them from going outside. After the group showed up, Wang's landlord broke his lease with the couple and tried to chase them out by cutting off water, gas and electricity. To cope with the inflicted blackouts, the couple installed a solar panel and stockpiled drinking water and food staples. The same scenario occurred repeatedly over the past two months, when they were asked to leave several hotels the same day they checked in. We don't even have the most basic, normal life. My son isn't able to go to school and is followed by a group of unknown people every day. And the police come to our door in the middle of the night. Wang's wife recounted the ordeal and couldn't hold back her tears. When we moved into a new place, people who claimed to be the landlord came barging in in the middle of the night when we were sleeping, shouting and cursing, and they grabbed our child and picked him up off the bed, and in the middle of the night they threw us out of the house. Such harassment is a widespread legal practice used by Chinese authorities. The goal is to pressure those deemed troublesome into leaving Beijing. Curious timing adds to the situation. 
Wang's evictions came as the country's capital hosted a series of high-profile visits by foreign dignitaries, including French President Emmanuel Macron, Germany's foreign minister, and most recently, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Wang and his family are just some of those being targeted. One of his colleagues is under similar pressure, while another was forced to flee Beijing. A fourth lawyer was detained along with his wife. The four are members of a group known as the 709 Lawyers. The figure refers to July 9, 2015, when Chinese police arrested hundreds of human rights lawyers and activists nationwide. Wang and the other three were all disbarred during the clampdown, but continued practicing law after their release. The group is known to defend adherents of Falun Gong, a meditative practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. Since 1999, countless Falun Gong practitioners have been jailed, tortured, or even killed for their organs. Defenders of Falun Gong are also subject to Beijing's repression. The most prominent is lawyer Zhe Shangao, who was detained and tortured multiple times since 2006. He went missing again in 2017 and has not been heard from since. This April, the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee held a hearing concerning the whereabouts of both Gao and other prisoners of conscience. That's over today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what's coming up in our second half. Imagine a major U.S. adversary gaining control over America's food and energy supply and getting a stranglehold on markets and infrastructure. Those fears may now be turning into reality, with China owning nearly twice as many acres of U.S. land as makes up New York City. Where is that land located? And does Washington even have all the information? And how should lawmakers handle it? We sat down with John Mills, retired Army colonel and author of The Nation Will Follow for details. The full episode is available on ntd.com. To find it, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer and see you tomorrow.